podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to this next episode of The Therapy Show um, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones, only it's not Bob this week. Um, we've got Bob's wonderful wife, Steph, who's also a psychotherapist and um, are you co-founder of the Manchester Institute? No, I'm just a co-director. Co-director. Bob, um, um, but, you know, uh, uh, what they say about uh, a great man behind every great man is a great woman. So. Even better woman, even better, not just great, Steph. Um, so we're going to continue on the theme of working with different clients. And um, this week we're going to be talking about the antisocial clients. Steph's, Steph's an expert in this field. So Bob's giving up his chair to Steph so that she can talk about this. So what we normally do with Bob is kind of talk about how the client presents and then maybe the treatment plan and how we work with the antisocial client. Okay, fine. So, so over to uh, you, what, what do you want to start off doing? Uh, first of all, only to say, I've had experience uh, in my early so social work life working with antisocials. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm an expert, but I quite like working with them actually, because they're a challenge and they're quite good fun. Yeah. Uh, well, they can be. What age would you say that you can start to see this personality type develop? I would say in their teens usually, because, you know, that's the time of life we expect kids to start getting it together. Uh, and being responsible, um, you know, it's the time, te although teenagers have got a reputation uh, of, of being um, a bit riotous and, you know, getting into trouble, but antisocials are forever getting into trouble. They have no sense of boundaries. So I would say it usually is more apparent in the teenage years. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking that, I think that was probably the first time that I came across anybody that I thought was possibly this was when I was fostering teenage boys. Oh yeah, <laughs> there, yeah. there was there was yeah. quite a bit that was kind of oh this is this is something different. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting that you're saying that you, you you came across it whilst fostering because it's usually kids come into the fostering realm, you know my experience anyway as, as a previously social worker um because parents can't manage them and it's usually they've not been managed as yeah. to when they come into care and you end up you know having to deal with that uh, and the you know the, the flack that comes from a child who hasn't been consistently parented yeah, yeah. And like you said, the, the boundaries and things like that was, yeah. was an issue. Yeah. And consequences, not realising how their actions yeah. had a consequence. No, no, they, don't, they don't really have, you know, um, what's it called? They don't have a, a sense of uh, their impact, really. Yeah, they yeah. They don't have any sense of the other. Uh, I think that was the thing that I noticed more than anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the key issue really is that they, they come from a background where there is um, uh, hardly any parenting, minimal parenting or no parenting at all. So, you know, on, on the spectrum, the middle yeah. is minimal, yeah. there's none, and that's hardly any. Yeah. Um, and depending on that level, depends on what kind of behaviour you end up having to manage. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the clinical picture is, um, I, actually, I actually wrote an article, so I've got the, the clinical picture is um, that they, they tend to be a challenge to work with because they have no sense of um, the norm, normal boundaries. Yeah. And boundaries are just so difficult to keep with an antisocial because once the damage is done you have to work so hard to reset the boundary yeah and it takes an awful lot of energy and you know possibly 
near near a near enough saint like patience <laughs> to keep that continuum going yeah um because you know they 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 tend to do the acting out because it's a way of them dealing with feelings so if you have an inconsistent parent you'll know that parent has not dealt with those feelings yeah so what they do is they initially at a younger age act out to get attention then the acting out becomes really quite serious as they get older and as yeah. you know adolescent acting out can can go into the realm of offending yeah yeah so you end up with the police knocking on your door yeah um and you know they use their behavior to protect themselves from feelings um and because one of the things that happens when they're very young is they usually come from a background where they have a very um, laissez-faire, if you like, laid-back mother one minute, who is somebody who anything will go with, and then she'll, they'll have a, a mother that's attend, attentive, or on the other extreme, so it's a bit like, you know, the, 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 the three levels I said about slightly involving min, minimal and not at all, yeah. that's a reflection of the mother who does the same thing, and when she's at her worst she'll hit them or push them away or reject them and say get out you know I don't want any, anything to do with you and possibly even become violent with them um, so you can understand how come they've got this this vessel full of anger and sadness they can't do anything about so to manage it they act out yeah which is really really difficult to deal with if you're the one that's having to uh, deal with the fallout yeah um, so they tend to have a little bit of a tough guy outside sense of being and a real empty inside sense of being. Um, and they'll want high, high stimulation because they cannot deal with boredom. So they'll always be wanting to do something. So, you you know, the, the, the younger adolescent will get into mischief, break windows, you know, uh, nick things go stealing, nick someone's bike. The older adolescent will get into fights and that kind of high level stimulation uh, and break in and do burglary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, they are very dependent on external stimuli, very dependent. So slightly narcissistic components if you think about it because it's all about them. Yeah, I think that was the thing that I kind of struggled to separate out was is this narcissistic or is this antisocial there, there was definitely a crossover and that you know inability to take responsibility for things yeah. you know they did it because they did this to me or you know it, it was it they just never took responsibility for their actions and again that's all about the defense that yeah. kind of wall they build up yeah that they don't want you to get through and they also have slightly sadistic components about them as well, because they are really angry, ragingly angry about yeah. the rejections. You know, so the, so the antisocial male, depending on the level, uh, would have had a really, uh, not just a really uninvolving mother, but um, a really uninvolving father who's n probably never been there to set the boundaries or to show this is what a, you know, a, a male, yeah, yeah. Um, so they have um, a tendency to want to take it out on somebody, yeah, and not really have any uh, thoughts afterwards of the impact that has, and no conscience, yeah. Um, so what they do need is a really strong structure to be able to function and they don't have that they don't have that because it's not been more modeled for them um and and when that happens is they tend to although you probably don't see it or you might just see a little bit of it go into extreme panic and fear if things don't go the way they thought they were going to go yeah yeah the way they defend against that is violence or anger or acting out in some way but internally internally they are fearful and frightful of whatever's going on for them because they don't have that internal parent that says it's going to be all right you've got options you can go and get help from x y and z yeah because the other decision they would have made fairly early on in their early life is they're never going to 
ever going to let anybody get close enough to let them down in the way that their parents have let them down. Yeah. yeah. So that's the bottom line. So they don't ask for support. They don't ask for help. So they live in this world where they need this, you know, real extreme stimulus to defend, defend against the extreme fear and scare and panic. Which is a, a, a nightmare for them. <laughs> you know, it, it's, yeah, you can understand when you're talking about it like that, the, the teenagers that I was working with, the, the real extremes, you know, and not wanting to stereotype, but particularly males will cover up fear and anxiety with aggression and anger anyway, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's a shame. Being on the receiving end of it is difficult, but for them, you know, on the other side, it's it's a nightmare. When you think about what the experiences must have been like for them as children to yeah. be in the, in the role of having to parent themselves all the time, yeah. So that that way of being doesn't change in their adult life. They're still no. kind of parenting themselves from a child perspective. Yeah, yeah. So no, very black and white stuff. You're either nice or you're not nice. You, yeah, it's either good or it's bad. In TA terms, if you think about it, what, how we talk about it is that um, in the child, they've got, uh, in the child ego state, you've got um, P1, A1 and C1. Yeah. Um, and mostly the decision making comes from from P1 and, and A1. Yeah. Um, you know, which is like a very undeveloped parent yeah. So um, I was thinking, uh, thinking about a couple I worked with, and the guy was typically, typically antisocial, and he parented his ch his children from a small, almost like uh, a childlike way of parenting them. There was no leeway. There was no um, okay, let's negotiate, or you know, no ex talking things through. It was. You did this, so you're gonna have this because that's what I think you should have. Yeah. Um, and and that's that's how he th thought it should be done. And he's he was really functioning from a very small child place, really. Yeah. When I was was doing my training, the way that I kind of got my head around that was because I'm a nursery nurse. That was one of my first jobs, is to remember what it was like in the you know the role play corner when I was working in reception class, when you saw, you know, and playing mums and dads with the baby, if the baby didn't stop crying, you know, picking it up and smacking its head against the wall to shut it up. It's that real basic parenting that little kids do. Yeah. So that's, you, yeah. That's exactly right. You're absolutely spot on, Jackie. So, you know, give, give the baby the mustard medicine. Yeah, that's what when you're talking about P1 and A1, it's that kind of basic, just yeah. stop doing what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And so I was squirting washing up liquid in their children's mouths for bad mouthing back at him. Yeah. So I mean, real extreme stuff. Yeah. It was quite yeah. shocking. Yeah, yeah. When they told me about this. Um, <laughs> it's, it, you can imagine the buttons it's pressed with me. Yes, yeah. Safeguarding, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But from their point of view, it makes perfect sense. That to me was one of the difficulties. Is that what, I don't see what the problem is. That makes sense. Why? Why is that not appropriate? <laughs> yeah, and and so, and so um, they have an extreme fear if if their behaviour doesn't work, and that's one of the ways they kind of try kind. Uh, uh, take back control um and you know from a from a, um, a, a parenting message a motherly message i guess or a female antisocial message it will be you need me i don't need you yeah and from a male clinical picture is i'll test you out but i won't believe you so you can see how that would be a huge challenge in the therapy room for you and as you as a foster mother to kids who are yeah. you know, antisocial, how do you connect with those kids? How do you connect with those people who have that view of relationships? Yeah. It's exhausting. <laughs> yeah, because they have a low frustration uh, 
tolerance. Yeah. They seek excitement and drama. They have higher energy. They also tend to be uh, quite goal oriented as well because they quite like the 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 comeback and the strokes from achievement. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they do think really well on their feet. Um, it's just that they tend to be so they make such irrational decisions. Their decision making is not thought out decision making. Yeah. Yeah. They tend to get themselves into problems. And there's different types of um, uh, antisocial presentation. So there's the impulsive type, the explosive type. Um, there's also the perverted antisocial presentation as well, where they, uh, they become um, eroticized by other people's displeasure. Uh, with the displeasure of others um, and being the bad object of another. So it will be someone who will talk about things in a very sexual way in company to see people squirm yeah. uh, and the discomfort in the response to that. And gamblers, that's another presentation because um, the rules of the game become their external structure. So that gives them the boundaries um and they tend to think about it in terms of well you can trust the roulette wheel but you can't trust the man yeah yeah uh, and also the other presentation is addictions um because that's another way of dealing with their feelings so in the therapy room is that is that kind of where your target is is to you know encourage feelings as opposed to the behavior well i think i think first of all i mean i i always think about an antisocial as being like a very naughty child yeah <laughs> really um and so what they need to, to know is how they impact you if they're committed to change then you make that contract with them i mean i would make a contract in yeah, the therapy yeah. room say okay you've come because you've lost your job or your relationship's not working let's have an understanding of what that's about and I'll get a sense of them being antisocial and I'll say well it seems to me like what might be useful is that uh, you get some feedback about how I'm impacted about what you tell me yeah yeah so uh, I remember doing some supervision with somebody who had an antisocial client and he would come straight from McDonald's bring his drink finish it very loudly you know when the straw reaches yeah, the bottom, gurgling <laughs> and then he would burp really loudly and she said he would do that every time and have no sense of the impact of the yeah it was like for me in the room him coming and you know slurping his drink and then burping and I said well he's an antisocial so unless you say to him hey I just want to feed something back to you I just find that really uncomfortable when you do that I'd rather you didn't um, how's he going to know? Yeah. Because yeah, very often they don't know. So it's a bit like, you know, if, you, if you're living in a house where nobody um, sets the boundaries in, in terms of making sure that you go out the house with a coat on. Yeah, yeah. In the middle of winter, you go out the house without a coat on, you freeze. And yeah. it's not until afterwards they go, oh, I'm cold and I'm freezing. So they, they have to have had those stepping stones put in place. So what the antisocial, is act, the, the acting out of an antisocial isn't always something that they consciously plan to do. It's just the way they think they have to be. Yeah. So the role of the therapist, first of all, is to bring that um, into their awareness. Um, and stroking them for doing it really and saying great I'm really glad I really appreciate you doing that thank you yeah 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 sometimes paradoxical interventions are really good as well if you know what I mean so uh, you actually give them a negative but it's actually a positive yeah so go on say a bit more about that so um you know they they might um when when you when they turn up at your therapy room they're up there before you and uh smoking yeah yeah uh and chucking the you know the butt on the floor outside your therapy door uh now if you were to say don't do that 
please don't do that, that would trigger their antisocial response maybe and be rebellious about it. So you might want to say, oh, here we go again. Another nail in your coffin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another nail in your coffin so that you have an early demise. So you can do it in a jokey way. Yeah. So you're not hitting them head on. You're kind of going under the radar, so you to speak. Humor as yeah. the paradoxical in intervention. So uh, I, I once was working with a young girl who was really antisocial and um, used to find it very difficult to connect with me when she came in the room and, you know, would mess about and ping things and, you know, yeah. chuck things in the paper basket. And one day she came in and she put the blanket over her head and was giggling underneath the blanket. So I got up off my therapy chair and got underneath the, the blanket with her. Bless. <laughs> therapy under the blanket. Let's think look. outside the box. It works. Yeah. So it, it's stuff like that. Um, and it's not what they expect either. It, no. it, you know, th that can be a big thing if you're a bit off the wall as well. It kind of normalises some of their behaviour too. Yeah. 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 So, you know, high doses of neg negative stroking is, uh, is very often quite effective. Yeah. 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 So, you know, when they say something like, and you know what happened today? I got I got sent out the schoolroom four times. Uh, Miss sent me out four times. Yeah. So um, you could say something like, well, somebody who wears their shirt hanging out and their tie hanging off looking like a tramp would get sent out the room four times. So nothing to do with his behavior, but just to joke about his demeanor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, and positive strokes really from, the ch from a child ego state, uh, rather than from adult. So yeah. if you're gonna stroke them from child, you stroke them for, it's less threatening if you do it, if you hit, try to hit their, the child part of them yeah uh, you know for example to say oh you know what I really liked it you did that and, I, and I'm sorry you had a hard time or something you know some kind of nurturing response rather than a yeah oh great nice one which is an adult response yeah yeah because I would imagine you know if if you are trying to give them validation and recognition they, they, they're not going to trust it for one and they're probably going to throw it right back at you <laughs> you know the, the foster kids that we had it was like yeah well what do you know you know nothing if ever I went in you know like you say with an adult praise or recognition they would it was yeah they'd just throw it straight back at me a lot of it was humor a lot of it was banter it was that that was how we used to connect to them yeah so you kind of have to do that. <gasps> oh my God, yeah. you made your bed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even then, it, you know, you'd think, yeah, I've, I've made a connection, but the day after it had gone again, you were constantly playing catch up all the time. Yeah. That lack of trust was, yeah. So you kind of have to play it the same way as they are really and be unpredictable, be zany. Yeah. Like getting under the blanket and having a giggle with them. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I would imagine even in the therapy room, it's it's not taking it personally, which, you know, it is easy said and sometimes it's difficult to do. That yeah. it, It's not personal. It's not. Yeah. Yeah, it isn't personal. It, and, and it is. It, it's really important to, to stay on track. Yeah. And not be hooked on the subject either so you know um to find ways of picking it up later on and letting things drop so you can come back to it so yeah. you don't hook that rebelliousness or yeah. that antisocial response towards you and does that link in as well to what you were saying about them having you know a low tolerance you know for staying on track and and they need high stimulus to you know to, to expect to just be working on one topic in a session would yeah. be quite difficult for them to do so to be spontaneous and yeah obviously have a treatment plan but it's it's up to negotiation or adapting <laughs> yeah so it's kind of still you know it's like saying things like to them you know um 
you know, when they shrug the shoulders or they don't answer you, that you say, um, God, I'm bloody fed up with you now because I'm still getting, you know, I'm getting shrugs off you and not yeah. getting responses. Yeah. Which is a true, you are. Yeah. I'm not yeah. trying to be nicey nicey and, and saying, oh, well, I can understand you shrugging. Yeah. What about boundaries in the sessions? Are you would you be quite firm in the boundaries? Is yeah. that the one time where you would be quite, you know, yeah. parent it with the the times, finishing time, start times, what's acceptable within the sessions? Yeah. So yeah. If they came late, I would say, ah, oh, here we go again. You're late, aren't you? You know, and and make a point of saying. Well, we're still finishing on time. Yeah. And then when the time comes, say, bye. Yeah. Maybe 25 minutes, but tough luck. Yeah. You should have come for your full hour on yeah. time. Yeah. That, that kind of thing. And, and be very, very strict on boundaries. Yeah. Let them know what, what's acceptable and what's unacceptable for you. Because then they know where they are in the scheme of things, because that's the one thing they've never had. No one's ever told them uh, as, a, as a child exactly how things are going to be, because one minute it's this way, yeah. and the next minute it's that way. You know, they've had very little parenting, minimal parenting, or no parenting. Yeah. So you have to use your positive controlling parent very clearly with them and make it clear that. You will pay me when you come. The session will last this long. If you don't turn up on time, um, it still ends at the same time. Same time, yeah. If you don't turn up at all, you're going to have to pay me next time you come. Yeah. But those kind of things. Yeah. That are really clear. Um, it's, I think working with them as well is it's important to point out the inconsistencies between what happened to them in the past. You know, make it very clear to them how come they do what they do. Because I think they really need to understand that. And again, it's helping them become accountable for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. What they do now because of what happened then is not working. No. But they can do something different and they have got choices. Yeah. I mean, that, that's probably something that will take a bit of time in the therapy because obviously the one thing that they find difficult is staying in a relationship long enough for that to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that because they, they do have quite a strong please others because they do like the attention and getting the recognition and the validation. So up to a point, they are quite people-pleasing in a manipulative kind of way yeah. to a certain extent yeah which I suppose that links into the narcissistic that we, we we've talked about in the past well the manipulation has really worked for them yeah in the past because that's helped them to get what they need yeah um so they they'll have relationships with people who meet their needs yeah 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 rather than people they can feel connected to so they won't really have a strong sense of what it's like to be in a healthy att attaching relationship yeah is it would you say that there's quite a bit of self-sabotage goes on then in relationships that you know if if the other is starting to form an attachment that they will sabotage the relationship and get out of it because they don't know how to be in that relationship I think what tends to happen is the the partner feels frustrated because they uh, they don't appear to be as committed as they would like them to be, and they put pressure on them, and that 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 then causes them to panic. Yeah, that's when they get fearful and panic, and so they'll escalate their behaviour in some way to stop that that uh, other person from getting closer and closer to them and you'll see that happening in the therapy room they'll try and do things to sabotage the therapy yeah but what you have to do is bring that into their awareness and, and say you know what i think you might be doing so you might be doing a number on me unconsciously so i'm bringing that into your aware awareness yeah yeah 
Um, so again, you've got to be on your toes with them in the therapy room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 they can be charming manipulators. So they can be so charming. And, you know, the boys that I, I work with, I uh, only work with a couple of girls who are like that. But it was mainly young men, actually. Yeah. Who were like that were very good at getting you on their side yeah because you know I did a lot of assessments for juvenile court and had to write, write a report so of course they want the best sentence ever and they don't want to go down and get put away into juvenile halls yeah um so you know they would be on their best behavior yeah I think that was the relationship that I had with you know a lot of the the foster children they, you know I was attached to them. I, I did like them. The behaviour was really difficult at times, but yeah, I liked being around them. Yeah. It, 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 for me, it just felt like if you slept on it, you started back from scratch the morning after. It wasn't like they could carry on that nice relationship into the next day. It was like every day you were starting from scratch with them. That, that was what used to exhaust me yeah 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 and uh i i remember instances of, of working with the young young boys uh you know we used to take them on holidays and stuff like that in the summer yeah because they very often hadn't been on holidays and you they would go from being 16 year olds to like you know little boys 10 year olds yeah having such fun because they've never never had that opportunity with the parents they were with they would have fun with you yeah. And you would see that vulnerability. But the next day it would start again. Yeah. You know, yeah. You'd probably do something to sabotage it in the evening by sneaking out and buying loads of alcohol and getting totally blotto. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Sounds very familiar. <laughs> I remember sleeping taking some kids to a log cabin and quite a few were antisocial, had quite high traits of antisocialness. Yeah. Uh, and the and the the uh, you know the support workers were in one cab one side of the cabin, in the middle was the living area, and the other side was their their bedroom, and they just kept us away most of the night. Three o'clock in the morning, I just got out of my bed and I and I yanked one of the kids out of their bed, took them into my room, chucked him in my bed, and I slept in the room with the kids, uh, and that was it. They never made another sound all night long. <laughs> bless <laughs> happy memories it's funny how when when you look back on things yeah. you know you can see why they did what they did when you're in it I always found it quite difficult living with somebody who displaying antisocial behavior is is quite intense in a therapy room I think it's it's different yeah it is different uh, and they, <clears throat> because by the time they come to therapy they're realizing that they need to do something about what's going on for them yeah yeah what you get in I suppose in your in your foster home is kids who are reeling from the damage that they've experienced yeah uh, and you're getting the flack from that what sort of thing do you think would bring an adult into therapy what what kind of would be the catalyst for them to seek help? Um, probably to do with relationship problems more than anything. Yeah. Uh, problems at work. Um, so, you know, stuff like fiddling the books and getting caught. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. And, then, and then their relationship fell apart because the wife found out they'd lost the job because they were fiddling the books. Those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it would be that risk taking, that breaking the law, that on the verge yeah. of illegal activities type things. Yes, it would. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you think about um, think about the um, uh, in terms of the um, what we call the TA present the the TA style presentations, you know the games the games that they play, the sort of high level games that they do play is cops and robbers. Yeah. Right. Catch me if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Very often that's the major game that they play. Um, but uh, and they do have very strong don't make it uh, decisions. 
uh, don't don't be close don't feel don't don't think but do think to art smart people yes yeah so they're the kinds of things that you would be dealing with in the therapy room really that they they sail pretty close to the wind yeah exciting day's work though <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing a guest appearance, Steph. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And good to speak to you too. Yes, no doubt we'll have you back again. Take care. And you. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.